But okay, go ahead. Okay, so so this is about Cython, which is the uh, um, new version. It's not Pyrex. It's not SageX. It's now <laughs> Cython, and hopefully we'll stay with actually. Cython. And we and we have the domain name Cython.org. Yes. So um, that's an awesome name, actually. What? It's, it's up there with Pyrex, actually. It's you like a, it? It's a good name, yeah. Yeah, because it's yeah. like Python and C. You just put a C at the beginning. It well, it's also like, like, it, it and it sounds, sounds like cool. Scythe, which you know, something you cut through a whole lot of stuff. Ooh. I never thought of that. Maybe join a call. Yeah. Oh, yep. that's it. <laughs> the, version, the version that comes in Sage is called S Cypher. The thing is, you don't have to have a Sage version. Uh, yeah. yeah. And um, the only other person who was Cypher was some punk rocker in England. Oh yeah, there's yeah. There's a but genre. we have now replaced him with the number one hit at Google. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So, um, He's down at number like six, five, um, five. Looks like. Yeah. yeah. So this is uh, um, the summary of Pyrex, and Cython is the same thing, except for we aim to do it a little bit better, but in cooperation with Pyrex. So um, we get cooperation with Pyrex. Yeah. Seems like it's been pretty good, actually. It has been. Yeah. Surprisingly good. So here's. Um, this is a summary of what Pyrex um, has set out to do and what Cython wants to do. And um, it just basically makes mixing C code and Python code together a lot easier. Whether it's C code that you're writing or interfacing with some other library, or you're writing stuff that looks like Python but it really um, compiles down to C, uh, much easier than writing your own interface from scratch in C or um, even the other things like Squig and stuff. So, um, and this is why we use it in Sage. We need a compiled language to do things fast and to incorporate other um, libraries. And it provides one nice thing about um, Pyrex is that it provides a consistent interface between our Python code base and our Python code base and our Pyrex code base. Um, and this is really nice for, mer for um, pushing stuff over from, um, it's easy to debug things and write things quickly in Python. And then you can just turn that into Pyrex Compile it and do it, you know, optimize it there once you've optimized it as much as you can in Python. And it also, you don't have this kind of rift of people who know how to develop Python but don't know how to develop that stuff. Um, so. Which I think is a major problem with Magma development, in my experience. Yeah, Nils, probably. you might attest to it. Yeah. It was a problem for me because. I couldn't, I couldn't learn in the amount of time I ever had when I went to Sydney how to write fast code in Magma that uses the, the C level. That's I and that's all Mark wrote. He couldn't write slow code. <laughs> <laughs> I don't use the interpreter. People ask me how to use Magma. Like, I don't use the interpreter. <laughs> I, I, I thought the abstraction was rather comfortable, actually. But you yes. liked it. Yes, <laughs> I would think so, too. <laughs> yeah. So in any case, we don't have that barrier. Um, and I think that's really good. And it's excellent for porting code from Python to Pyrex. Because if you just had to like, rewrite your thing in C, chances are you'd introduce a whole nother, another set of bugs. And then you'd have to debug it in C. And, uh, so, anyway, the talk is more about why we have Cython. Why don't we just use Pyrex? And so, um, probably the first reason is it's just hard to get Pyrex patches upstream. Um, hard means impossible. Yeah, unless you find a bug, he will include bug patches. Yeah. Um, he's not, you know, he's willing to accept those. But for a lot of stuff, I think it's a combination of the fact that he doesn't have tons of time. This is not like his day job or anything. And he wants to be sure that every, he wants to take responsibility for everything that's there. Yeah? What's the license requirements? And for Cython. <laughs> okay, so Cython is just going to be released under the Python license. Um, so that is because we hope eventually that it just gets included in Python. Uh, the Python is the Python license strictly more permissive than GPL? It, yes, well, because it's GPL compatible. It is GPL. And it's not the GPL. That's why Python yeah. can be in Sage. It's the right. yes. Yeah. Pyrex's license is, <coughs> a, I think it's the most permissive possible license. Is it like it's it's a public domain? Yeah, yeah. yeah, it says here's the source, do what you want with it, don't blame me if it breaks. Pyrex is free of restrictions. Yeah. He doesn't even assert, uh, he doesn't assert copyright, he has to assert copyright, that's automatic. But, he may assert mm -hmm. copyright. but, but a public domain would give up copyright too. Yeah. I mean, that's not a license. I don't think it's a public yeah. domain, that's but it's, it's, there's no restrictions at all. Okay, yeah. It's my, my kind of license. 
Well, it's public domain. Well, he doesn't say it's public domain. It's not public domain. And if he, if he doesn't accept it's the copyright, between public domain he still has the copyright. He's yeah. giving a license to do anything because you can, you can withdraw a license to do anything. So, so, yeah, so we're not drunk. <laughs> anyway, anyway, you're right. We're not yeah. drunk. Yeah. We don't have any alcohol. We can't talk about the license. The license <laughs> is, is good enough for us. The reason we chose Python is we're right. hoping that this will get included in Python. And we don't want to have the headaches of trying to change the license later on or something. Um, so these are the patches that we started off with trying because we needed them in Sage. And um, well, for the first one, cross directory imports, uh, Greg didn't think it was a bug. And, um, he never used it. He never, I guess, had projects that had 100,000 lines of Pyrex code in them, so he didn't need it. And um, and so um, and then the the other thing is we have this model release early, release often. Um, and so we've had 153 saved releases in the last two years or so. <laughs> yeah. And. Um, Granted, some of these are pretty small, but they're all, they're all listed. <laughs> and actually, there are more if you, because sometimes I'll release and then I'll realize that was a stupid release and just delete it. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so contrast that with in the I same time, the Pyrex had lot. six releases. Yeah. And essentially, there were two releases. There was uh, 0.9.4, and then like two days later, 0.9.4.1, point one, and then 0.9.4.1a. <laughs> and then, and then for well, it was like 18 months, you know, that was the standard version of Pyrex until last January there was 0.9.5, and then 0.9.5.1, and then 0.9.5.1a. <laughs> you know, in like that was that was the release often portion of the the, the release often week. Just like uh, Web 2 C or. And then um, and it's been there ever since. So we want to we want to be able to include things a little bit faster than that, um, and then uh, we want more out of Pyrex than uh, Greg has time or energy to provide. And um, some of the things is um, just additional features like list comprehension makes writing a lot of mathematical things really nice. Um, in place operators and um, stuff like that, and then optimization um, that we can't wait for. Um, and I, there's a big list of uh, optimizations. Um, that I went through last time. So, um, yeah? How about C++ support? Um, yeah. That would be great. Do you want to add it? Uh, I'm not the one what does that mean, actually? Sure. Yeah, what do you right. actually want? We already have C++. No, I, I know it's possible, but I mean, it's like, uh, fine is supporting all, I mean, supporting templates, that's going to be tough. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's, um, you're, so you have to write, mean, yeah. It would probably be something that, that can be added, you know, somehow, but I mean, Full C++ support. That's going to be really tough. You could imagine doing things like um, for C++ types that override operators, yes. like propagating those down to the code. Yes, um, which I think means deleting the error message and just letting it go. Yeah, if you know C++. I mean, yeah, but <laughs> I, don't, I don't. I don't know C++ very well at all. It's such a complicated language. It's so yeah. orders of magnitude more complicated well, that's, than C. Well, that's redefined as a certain subset of C++ to be determined which subset of the C++ yeah. even more defined yeah. Well, I think yeah, yeah. Not, not to get into the deep C++ discussion, but there's like, uh, there's no compiler which implements the standard even re close, remotely close. <laughs> that's all, you're No, so what about the, the, this specific the question about operators, why, why don't you just let the operators go through and let the, the C or C++ compiler complain if, if the types, if the operator cannot be applied to the types, rather than... Because well, yeah. the problem I is can give some answers to that. Cyclone is not... Yeah. I think for starters, it's extremely desirable that Cyclone never generates code that the compiler is going to complain on. That's almost... Now that's it's one of the goals. It's very confusing if you get an error message, which is in the C code. Whereas with Cyclone, it gives, when Cyclone gives you an error message, it points to the Cyclone code that you're compiling. If the compiler gives you an error message, you're like, uh-oh, something really went wrong. I have no idea where. It's in the middle of some massive amount of auto-generated code. It was very confusing and hard to deal with. Yeah. Look, it's yeah. not yeah. hard. That, that, in that example, is not hard. Because when you, when you, do, uh, when you import a, a class with a, with a uh, Extern, what is it, struct or C type def struct or something, and you pull it out, you can just somehow give some syntax to operator plus. Because, I mean, yeah. the, the, the Cython error messages indicate that it knows what the types are. And if you tell it you can do plus on those types, 
that would be what, That's what I was going. Is yeah. you tell it you you tell it that you can do arithmetic on these types because I agree the sci the Cython error messages are much more comprehensible than GCC error messages, especially GCC error messages in the midst of you know thirty lines of because you know generated code. So try try Linux template error messages. Plus, I mean, it's GCC error messages anyways are not very good. But any yeah. code, they're really hard to understand. So That's actually one of the things we improved a lot in Cython over Pyrex is the error messages. That's yeah, we have, been, we have improved a lot of the error messages. Because there I would just say this line number has a problem, but it wouldn't tell you anything about the context of it. You'd have to look in the file to figure out where it actually was a problem. Yeah. So, a problem. Yes, we can. Um, so one of the things we realized after working on kind of, we had our um, independent fork of Pyrex plus a bunch of patches, is that um, in all this time, nothing we added was really specific to Sage, um, which actually was kind of surprising. Um, and then the other thing is we started getting emails from other people. The first person was a fireman working in Kirkland, who actually went and downloaded the entire Sage package so he could get our, our Pyrex version. Um, <laughs> See, he was a fireman? He was a yeah. fireman. Well, and this was relevant for what I needed. This, he was, they were working on, um, he was writing a Python interface to some computer system they used. And um, the thing is that um, the computer system, from what I understand, was in C and they had to interface with it. Um, so, and you know, that, that, that made me realize other people are interested. And then other emails started trickling in about, oh, how do you use this? And so I started posting stuff on, you know, Python. Pyrex mailing list. Well, if you are using our version of Pyrex, you can just do a list comprehension here. And, uh, <laughs> you know, then the emails really started flowing. <laughs> so, um, so we realized it was time to do another uh, port. So here it is, Cython. Um, so we've got a web page, domain, uh, Mercurial repository, wiki, wiki, um, bug tracker um, that actually has a fair amount of bugs. Um, that are being tracked and fixed by people. Mailing list, um, Stefan was the guy who set this up. He doesn't like Google groups, um, so he set up this list, and it works okay. Um, but you can't, like, the archives aren't instant and stuff like that. But who, who is that? Ste Stefan, uh, I don't, Benel? I, I don't yeah, know how that's the right. Stefan He's the guy who behind LXML, which is yeah. the Python package for. XML processing. So but he is the other Cython yeah, person. And he was the one with the other Pyrex port. Yeah. All right. So, so exactly. you, your folks joined up? Yeah. And uh, if you look at the web page, can you show them the web page for a second? Yeah. It's, uh, so the project good. people are. Well, Alpha is good, right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So here is uh, the Cython web page. You can see that people are Stefan, Robert, and Okay. There's uh, all he's really, stuff. I think he's very involved. In so does, fact, is he involved in any other large projects that use Cython? LXML is. LXML is his project that uses Cython. Which I think is a pretty big important project. Yeah. So, um, and so. But look, there's a link to our wiki. Yeah, even, yeah, he even has yeah. a link to our wiki. Yeah. Which, and our wiki looks, so if you click there, it looks like the Cython web page. Yeah. yeah. So, and uh, is it wiki used? Um, somebody emailed me a few days ago. I was like, I wanted the, I want the wiki to be like this, 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 and this. And I said, that sounds great. Do it. And then he edited the wiki a bunch to do that. Yeah. But, um, people were requesting having a wiki on the Pyrex mailing list, and I responded, I'll set up a wiki at wiki Cython, or you're very welcome to use it for Pyrex or Cython stuff. And people use it, for instance, when they have like some obscure message that they couldn't figure out. They'll like put a little note on wiki wow. saying, if you run into this error, here's what the problem is. Yeah. Um, so there's a fact on the wiki. Yeah. So here's the Mercurial repository. Um, you can see that we're not the only ones with uh, patches. Yeah. There's all kinds of interesting things that came up with Cython once we did this, which was support for old versions of GCC, support for Windows, mm -hmm. like all kinds of funny things we don't care about for Sage, but other people would report and then fix. Yeah, support for older versions of Python. So now. The uh, Cython code that's generated, it doesn't matter what version of Python you use to generate that code. That will compile for Python 2.3, 2.4, or 2.5. It's a cross compiler. Yeah. 
So, um, so first there were issues to think about when we were forking. First, one of the issues is just the politics of forking a project. Um, and so we actually sent several emails out to Greg. Um, some were pretty explicit. You know, <laughs> Greg, what do you think about us forking? <laughs> And, and some very explicit <laughs> messages like that from other people who I, yeah. I don't know who they are, but they're like, please comment on Scython. Yeah, and, um, and he really didn't answer to any of it. I think he answered one finally. Yeah, I think so. And, and since then, he has been in communication with a lot of the people doing stuff for Scython. Um, for instance, one of the things is um, acquiring the guild. And um, so someone came up with a patch for that for Scython and said, what do you think? And he joined in the discussion talking about you know, what his plans were for the guild and trying to you know, reach a consensus for how that was going to work. Um, what happened? I couldn't um, even read. There were so many messages. I couldn't keep up with it all. Yeah. There's like a 50 or 60 messages. So, well, what happened um, is they had very different ideas for what was supposed to happen. Very conflicting um, times. For instance, Greg was imagining that every, like it keeps track at every stage whether or not it has the guild. And if it wants to call a function that needs it, it gets the guild before calling it. Global interpreter lock. Python is not red thing. Yeah, so no, Python, right. if you want to do, Basically. if you want to touch anything in the Python, yeah, yeah you have to. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, <clears throat> but there's been kind of consensus, and the patches are not merged in yet, but it looks like we're going to merge in the patch, um, the original patch, mm -hmm. um, that, uh, that offers, you know, much less functionality than keep, keeping track of it everywhere, but it's uh, enough. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's definitely useful, cool. necessary. Um, and then eventually, uh, Greg Plant has these other plans. We're going to see what, where that goes. So um, then the other issue is merging. Um, when people make improvements to Pyrex, um, how do you get those into Cython? Um, and so um, Pyrex has released, like I said, you know, once every 18 months, and it's this huge package. Um, there's no history, so you can't like look and see you know what the different patches did. Um, what you can do is you can just like do a diff of the old version, the new version, <laughs> and just be amazed at how many changes there are. Oh no. Um, and uh, yeah, so I merged in uh, um, this update here. That took a while, um, and I'm really scared to do more merging, and kind of kind of hope that. Um, People would release stuff for Cython and form patches. And uh, because that was really painful. And that was, I had made most of the changes to the source. And so at least I knew what was going on in all the conflicts. Um, and just imagining doing it without knowing what was going on in you know, half of the conflicts would just be scary. And then the other um, issue that you have with forking is that um, you're worried about um, you know, some developers working on this, some developers working on that. And um, I don't think that's uh, much of a deal because Greg's the only one who does active Pyrex development. And until now, um, you know, the most you had was like a, a patch here, a patch here to fix a typo, to fix some bug in GCC output. And most of the people who are doing patches are releasing incompatible with our version because that's where it's going to get included. Um, and I don't think actually we're forking so much as we're just merging all <laughs> non Pyrex forks. <laughs> And um, actually, with resources, it seems like they suddenly greatly increased. Yes. Because people, there are a bunch of people who I think would have contributed to Pyrex if it was made clear that you should. Yeah. And we're just like holding back or something because yeah. there's a lot of contribution, some good and some not. So there's this LXML Pyrex, and I have the feeling that there were other people who had other patches yeah. that did things that they liked, but it was kind of like everyone had Pyrex plus their private set of patches, and no one really knew where to put them. So um, it's been kind of this huge influx of people who. You know, you get the feeling they've been like, oh, I always wished it did this. And then they go in and they implement it, and now it doesn't. So um, the main developer is Stefan Benel. He uh, is one of the developers for LXML. And um, one of the big things that he's done, which I haven't looked into much, is the C API thing, where you can seed up a function and have it available to other things. Um, where you can compile a module and um, then call that function from other modules. Well, how does it work? I'm not sure. I, I couldn't figure it out yet. What? I no. thought we already had that. No, you can't C import a C a function. Oh, okay. So right now, you make a CDEF class that has a bunch of functions in it. And then you create an instance of that class and you can call those functions. So 
So you're saying that we should be able to do this somehow now? Yeah, yes, exactly. That was like one of his main things that made LXML Pirates different. But I tried the obvious things that didn't do anything, so I don't know how to do it. Yeah, there's, and I think it was um, designed more in mind with non-Pyrex things calling. We, we should look at the source code for LMX, LXML, so yeah. Python. So and is, is there, do you know if there's a mechanism for calling Pyrex from C? And That's like, the it would idea. Have, it would have to do all the name declaration or something? No, I think, it, I think there's okay. a declaration you do that declares it as a non-decorated name. The, the types will have oh. this fancy name decoration. So if you want to use Pyrex types in your methods, that might. So it actually gets oh, exported literally with the name that you'd see Deft as. I think so. I'm not sure. Huh. Yeah. But it's something to that effect. That seems a bit dangerous. You get all these clashes and all the stuff you're linking together. Yeah. Otherwise known as C. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it's, it's certainly not exported by default. It might be. It might. It might mingle it in like prefix the package information to it, but not do you know the really ugly name mingling that does internally. Uh, so that's something to look into. Uh, then this other person popped up, Thomas Hunger, and he had all these ideas. Started out with a little tiny stream of little fixes, and then um, he noticed that um, CDEF class level bodies were never run. And um, so he did some work on um, trying to get it. So in Python, when you have a class, um, you can put executable statements in that class. And, um, and one of those executable statements that he really wanted to use is using the class method. Um, so for instance, if you want to make a, a method class method, you say def foo, you know, self, dot, whatever. And then you say foo equals class method of foo. Um, and that took a little bit of work because in Python, is just interpreted. And so when it gets to that point, foo is just a function. And then it turns it into a class method. And then when it gets to the end of the class body, it appends all its members. Um, but you can't quite do that with CDEF classes. Because <laughs> it's not interpreted. So you don't, when you're halfway through the class, you're not running normal. You know, the interpreter's not running anything like that. But um, we figured out a way to get that get that to work so you can have class methods. Why do you want to do that, though? To have class methods. But, I mean, can't, wouldn't it, the more Dec natural way would be to just have some decorator after the CDEF instead of, instead of using that interpreter oh. idiom. It's sort of a bit weird. You want to do that to make it easy to port Python code to Pyrex code. Yeah. Like, in the, in the ideal world, you could just sense. be like developing something in Python and then you're like, oh, I wonder how it would run under Pyrex or under Cython. No, it's a really good, I mean, this thing where you do method equals class method of method, it's really nice because there, do you ever use the ampersand thing that's in Python? Do you know about that? Decorators? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's not the method. Yeah, just, if you put ampersand class method right before no, it's an it, sign. or otherwise, I'm, oh, ampersand's an and. Yeah, at sign. Yeah. So if you put at sign class method right before, it's yeah. equivalent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And don't think decorators are implemented at all. Not in Python, no. So. On the, it has to be on the list. Yeah. Because yeah. it makes sense to do in our, one of the like goals of Cython is supposed to be compile as much as Python as possible. Mm -hmm. Which are, I don't think we're that's, that far off from actually. Yeah, that's one of the main goals I think that differs with Pyrex. Yeah. We want to compile as much of Python as possible and be included in Python. Yeah. But in, in practice, if you write Python code, you're implicitly always relying on dynamic resolution of which method gets called. Yes. So that's that why it doesn't make any sense wrong, at all. Right? No, because I thought dynamic, dynamic generates code that dynamically moves mm -hmm. things up if it needs to. If I calls to the Python C API. Yeah. Except for the ones that you've overridden because they were too slow, like is instance and stuff like that. Well, yeah. Like in, yeah. in, in vanilla Pyrex, when you say is instance something, it sure. first of all does a name lookup for is instance. Sure, sure. But that was too slow, so you changed it. <laughs> now it's a direct call to the Python no, it actually CGI. calls it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right there. yeah. And I think I there's a way to get around that because there's a um, is call um, flag that gets set. And so you couldn't have it give the static, the C API version of is instance of the is calls flag, flag is set. And otherwise it returns the actual object as opposed to the method. But. <laughs> yeah. Because you think about optimizing polynomial multiplication. <laughs> I think about optimizing Python interpretation. 
I just, hope you, I just hope you never get upset with the code that GCC puts out. Because I think, I think you'll move down a level and you'll yeah. start hacking on GCC. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> then we're in trouble. It could be dangerous. <laughs> yeah. So, um, <laughs> and then um, he submitted a couple other patches. And then the other guy, Ulysses um, Furquim, I don't know if that's how you pronounce his last name. Um, anyway, so he's the one that um, came up with this callback idea. Um, so apparently when you write a, you can um, pass functions as callbacks, but when they're called, they don't necessarily have the GIL, the global interpreter. And so he wrote a lot of code that lets the function know that it needs to get, acquire the GIL before executing. And you can't, you can't just do that manually because the GIL needs to be acquired before you bankrupt the parameters of the function. Um, and so he wrote a lot of um, code to that. And then there's just other people have um, you know offered comments and suggestions and little patches, and that's been really nice. Um, so <clears throat> this is kind of new stuff that's in uh, um, Cython. So it has better support for, for previous versions of Python, better support for non-GCC, um, optimized method calling. So in a typical Python method, the way you call it is you pass in a tuple pass in the self parameter, a tuple of arguments, and a dictionary of keywords. And the thing is, there's an optimized method if, and then it has to unpack it into the arguments. But if your function has no methods, no, no arguments, all you need to do is pass in the self parameter. You don't need to pass in a tuple and unpack, unpack that. And if you have only one argument, instead of passing in a tuple, you can pass in that argument. Hmm, nice. And, um, so that has been implemented because, I don't know, like 90% of functions only take one parameter. Or did, you, did you implement that? I implemented that. Cool. Yeah. Um, um, so does it make sense to special case that further to two arguments? Uh, no, because you can't. You can't. Yeah, the so Python C API um, specifies the signature. Yes. Maybe, maybe it would, but I think. No, no. It's kind of diminishing returns, two arguments, mm -hmm. three arguments. Yeah. Yeah. That's useful to know about, though. Yeah. So um, special methods have doc strings. This is due to a patch by uh, Nick Alexander um, and some editing that actually led to this optimized method calling um, mm. because you actually have to set a flag and do some special stuff um, because the signatures are a little bit different. And then uh, fast tuple unpacking. So when you call like x comma y equals foo, before what it would do is return the tuple and then it call this tuple unpacking code we would call a sequence code and say, get the next item, get the next item. Um, and you want to be able to do this a lot faster because most of the time what's returned is a tuple. And so what it does now is it checks to see if it's exactly a tuple. And if it is, it just um, does the um, cap. And if it's, if it's a tuple and the right length, it unpacks it directly um, and using macros. So um, just nice. stuff like that. This is new as of last night. <laughs> Um, and so, wow, cool. What so you can do? call it to call function cdef overridable, and what that means, and there's also cdef visible. So you can override it with Python. So you can override it with override it in a Python class. Awesome. <gasps> Ooh. I remember. <laughs> oh, do you remember working that great shit out? Comes yeah. Because <laughs> I remember, like everything I write, I'm like, I wish it would be faster, and then I'm like. Okay, I'm going to write the CDEF method great. for this, and the Python method for this, and the dispatcher oh, method awesome. for this. And so right now what happens is if you, if you declare it as overridable, at the top of the generated CDEF function, it checks to see if it has a dictionary. If it has a dictionary, it does a lookup on that name. Mm. And then it doesn't necessarily always call it. It takes the thing that was a lookup and sees if it's a function that points to the original implementation. Oh, I'm confused. So every call into the CDEF has to every call has to do a dictionary lookup. No, every call into the CDEF sees if there's if there is a dictionary. It has dict, and which all of this stuff is always doing anyways. Yeah. Oh, and you're saying a, a, a Cython class will never by default have a dictionary unless yes. you're subclassing what? No, it won't have a dictionary unless like. It has a dictionary if and only if it can be overridden. Oh, so, and, or so you're, saying, overridden. you're saying if I have a Cython class, it doesn't have a dictionary. Yeah. And then you're saying if I then derive a Python class from it, it has a dictionary. then it has a dictionary, and so you're going to get some overhead anyway, so screw yeah. it. Yeah. Yep. And, oh, that's nice. And if you have a Cython class that has a dictionary, that means you could have overridden it manually by using this dictionary. 
Yeah. <laughs> Oh, and so yeah. So, even only if it has a dictionary, no matter what its status is, is right. it writable? Yeah. Right. That's and nice. Very nice. Yeah, and so what it does is then, if it has a dictionary, then it does a look on nice. it. And only if, and the thing it looks up, um, it returns the function, and it sees if that function, in fact, has been overridden. Because it knows what the function, it creates a function that points to the CDEF version. Then when it does the lookup, it sees if that function is a function that points to the CDEF version. And if it is, it just goes and does the CDEF version instead of calling the Python function. Yeah. For some reason, I'm confused by the last thing you said. Okay, so I don't know why. Do you understand it, David? No, 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 no. Why is yeah, that yeah, so. confusing? Right. So the thing is, it creates, it creates a function that points to That. Why is it even necessary to have an extra keyword? Oh, because oh, it's adding. It is adding a it slight adding performance. Yeah. Okay. And you know, you don't want to necessarily expose all your CDEF functions. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh right. So if it's CDEF overridable, then it's actually callable on Python level. Otherwise, it would so, not be so callable. So it's really callable on Python level. What this does yeah, is override. Such a good word, actually. What? Wait, wait. Now it's callable from Python. How? Now it is callable from Python. Because it, you put it in the dictionary. But there is no dictionary yet. If it's still, yeah, there's, there's, no dictionary. Dictionary. there's still a Cython plot. There's no dictionary. Why don't you know, Robert, yeah. work out this example? Okay, so this right here. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, it creates a wrapper, does it? It creates this function. This is called. <laughs> Oh, man, now I have to change all of this. <laughs> oh, that makes it so simple. <laughs> like that. And it actually yeah. does all the parameter parsing. Like if this is an int, it you know, turns this into an int before calling this guy. Yeah. Cool. And then beautiful. in it also, the, uh, <clears throat> it inserts some code here that's Pointer points to the same thing as this function. Uh -huh. And if it points to the same thing as this function, well, if it doesn't, then, then execute this. Otherwise, it goes on and does the CDEF version. So the x.foo is a dictionary lookup. Well, uh, not too well so let me. It's not really a dictionary lookup. So here, it'd be if. Um, Wait, I'm confused. So if you have foo in the dictionary, it can still call the method that's cdef. Yes. If. Why? Would it ever? Wait, doesn't foo so, always? What if I? No, what if I? Foo might. The foo might be this one. Foo which will is always the, be in the dictionary. Yeah, foo will be in the dictionary. But if it's not overridden, it will be this one. Hmm. Oh, I see. Yeah. So, so I then see. if you have an overridable, your Python class has a dictionary. That, your Cython class has a dictionary. That no, it has attributes. It doesn't have dictionary. Ah. This 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 right here will go into the types dictionary. Types. So yeah. the type has a dictionary. dictionary. So when you oh, go right, the right. Attribute. It looks in the class of the dictionary yeah. if there is one, and if it, there isn't one, or if it didn't find the class dictionary, right. it looks in the types dictionary, mm -hmm. which is where this thing sits. Types are not. Types are dictionary. Yeah. Types or objects themselves. Okay. Overridable. So, but this, but this means that, like, my CDEF function has an extra hash uh, checkup uh, over it. 
if you have if you label it as overridable, yes, then it has this. So it might not be the stuff we want for. But yeah. well, we have has ticks in all of our functions that are yeah. like that. So, to so what if oh, I no, 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 unless you call the C impulse what if directly. I override yeah. the subtraction, but I don't override the addition. Don't ask me why but I do that. Nobody knows. Yeah. But that then be your has yeah, yeah, no one has ever done <laughs> for the addition, okay. and you would do I mean, we some could. other lookups yeah, for the addition. These fat ones. So just because I overrode subtraction, then addition would become slower? Yeah, you could. No, just because you're implementing. Oh, you're right. Class you're not supposed to put. Which one uh, do you call? So if I override the C. integer in Python, yeah. the arithmetic will become And that, does, that yes, checks the dictionary. because you're dealing with the Python okay. things. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it won't, so it'll do a lookup. Wait, if it's Python, wait was, that wouldn't have been true before, though, would it? Yes, because uh, if you wanted to implement anything, you had to implement it just Python method. Yeah, but now, so I override, well, okay, overriding the integer is a stupid thing to do. No, it isn't. Uh, why do it's you not at all a stupid thing to do. Why do you even need five well, it's stupid because anymore. if you add to your word, Because devs were give you for to make want. things visible from Python. Why, not? why not do everything? You add. Because you might want to call stuff from Python. But like these things are callable from Python now, right? Okay, so... Yeah, it could be really useful for education. So imagine you, you're writing a polynomial. <laughs> this is degree. <laughs> Right. You want to know the degree of Python, right. but if you're in the CF function, you want to be able to call that really fast. Yes. So you don't so. want that has dict. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's almost like it's almost like you want the, you, you want the default to be the other way. Like you want you want everything to be overridable, and then you want you want like a CDF fast, which, yeah. <laughs> which is not overridable. <laughs> well. Well, they are fast yeah. until this. This doesn't work. hurt much. This is not a function. This is just uh, it looks in the struct of the type and sees if that uh, member is null. So this is really fast and um, doesn't you know slow it down. In fact, there's an unlikely surrounding this. So if branch prediction hints are used, <laughs> then it will say that this thing probably won't happen. <laughs> and even if this is the most common case, it's the most expensive. So yeah. you'd rather jump to this case if you can. If it actually done any profiling, sorry. If it actually done any profiling in this? Um, I have not. It's very new. He wrote it last night. Yeah. But it Whoa. it will be faster than what we currently have. Because right now, what happens is when you add two things, the elements have to you want to be able to have be able to define those element additions in function uh, CDEF functions to make them fast. But you want to be able to define them as Python functions as well, in case you're writing a class in Python. And then the dispatcher has to, this add C right here gets called, which decides whether or not to call add or add C impl. And this add function right here by default calls the add C impl. So yeah, right now, this always gets called if there's a dictionary period. And if, which is slow, this is a Python call. So we're saving that if you didn't actually override the add function. And we're also saving the method call from add C to add C impl. And we're simplifying things because now you just call add C. Um, and we get to delete those terrifying comments <laughs> yeah. from uh, element.php. Do not override this. Yeah. Override this one. This yeah. one is override yeah. it. Don't call it. Yeah. Plus, I mean, the, the idiom of this having these three things, or at least needing to be able to override like this, is something you want to use all over the place, but you're terrified to you know, introduce yeah. more of them because it's such a pain. So I have two questions. So first, when it does work has dict, isn't 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 that always true? No. Because, because the fact that you create def foo means that there is a dictionary. No, this no. looks at the no. type dictionary. Yeah, the type. This looks at the not object the dictionary, which may or may not exist, but doesn't exist by default on CDEF functions, on CDEF objects. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so there are basically there are now three types of functions that Cyphon can generate. You can generate, uh, you can generate these CDEF functions, CDEF overridable, and DEF functions. And you can also Public. do CDEF visible, which are not overridable. But um, CDEF visible. It was it was easy to do once I had this. It just <laughs> creates one of these. So That's you can nice. call it from C, but you can't necessarily overwrite. I mean, you can call it from Python, but you can't overwrite. It. But when you call it from C, or when you call it from Cyphon, it's faster. It's, it's a CDEF function as called from C. Nice. Yeah. That's very nice. But it's a Python. 
It that's another thing. It creates a Python mapper to the CDEF function. That's very oh, nice. That's, that's right. a pain in the butt. Sort of Did you make that yourself? Yeah. You it? Oh. That's incredibly useful. Because there's so many oh discussions gosh, about having like two function names. Like that. That. What? Is, is there still something for which you want to use def and not CDEF overridable? Yeah, that's a question. Nice question. <laughs> Why would you just make everything deaf and be done? Yeah. Um, is there a performance well, difference? Doesn't it have to do the does the deaf do the has dict business? No, deaf goes right into the function. But because deaf but would, the would be overridable, right? You could have yeah, deaf and deaf overridable. Well, you could just have deaf and C deaf, and deaf behind the scenes is just a C deaf overridable. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that's a good question. Maybe so hang on. So that means that means what you're really saying is that in the, if that was the model, that that means that a def function could be called from C directly. Yeah. yeah. And, and all it, all that happens yeah. is it's, it has this machinery yeah. to make sure that it goes to the Python version that's. Yeah. yeah. The, there's that's so much more natural to write. Yeah. It was so funny that these devs were not usable from. Well, they're usable, they're just slower. Well, yeah, no. I got the impression that I. Yeah, um, I'm, there are differences between CDEF and DEF functions that <coughs> might make it okay. different. Like, for instance, yeah. uh, a CDEF function has an accept. I guess you could put an accept on oh. here. One issue is you often, um, you could easily often accidentally call via Python and the def method interface instead of the cdef interface if you weren't forced. I mean, very often, you should be calling oh, the cdef yeah, version yeah. from some code, and you have to end up doing explicit cast, or you have to you know, make sure you, you import, c import the right thing. And if, you, if there's no distinction, you end up often doing Python calls when you should be doing Cython calls. And that might slow down your code a lot in yeah. those places. Do you know what I mean? that's true with the cdef override. Yes. Um, which is why maybe having that as a default would be a bad idea. <laughs> we put this in, everything's going to become overridable, and then pretty soon we'll just say, screw it, let's make it deck. That's what's going to happen. Well, I don't think everything, well, there's underscore functions that you don't necessarily want to underscore. There's different semantics, right? A def function takes anything as. Uh, def functions can take keywords, CDEF uh, functions oh. can't, for instance. But, but CDEF functions can take. Uh, arbitrary Python inputs too. Yeah. Yeah, so the CDEF keyword would get the Python dictionary. Oh, so you're saying you extend the CDEF function to be able to take keywords? Yeah, but that's <laughs> over. <laughs> it would get the dictionary. But you can't, but that's over. Yeah. Yeah. I would mean, get the yeah. pi object pointer. The point was that. Yeah, true. Yeah. yeah. There's not, do you no, want to no, do that? No, so you wouldn't do it. <laughs> so yeah, you're right. The, you're point, right. Point, do it. the point was that if you, if you do a def, and then let if you call the function Avoid from from Pyrex, from Cython, then you you call the entry point for for the CDEF yes. version, uh, and otherwise you don't. But but then the the semantics is not the same because one of the calls checks, and the other call doesn't check. Uh, yeah, you can't. So it's not the same mm -hmm. function. Yep. And it's related to the problem. I say that you have to explicitly cast, mm -hmm. but you actually want to be explicitly casting. I'm not talking. Well, why was I thinking will, of will the inputs? The I was talking about the x being cast or the self being cast. In order if, to if you don't cast, you'll oh. get this one. Here, the casting you're talking about is self. Like you have yes. an object foo, and you want to do foo. Sorry, an object bar, and you want to do bar dot foo. So you might. Yeah, you always get the, the def one if you don't make sure that bar has been explicitly casted to the Cython type. Yes. So you'll end up getting substantially slower code than you thought you would be getting. Yeah, but it's, isn't self implicitly cast? Self is no. implicitly cast. Except for uh, arithmetic, because it doesn't, mess, doesn't know whether right. left or right is self. No, it's not implicitly. It is. No, I mean, yeah, okay, it, no, you but you call the wrong. It's false, he does. Except for arithmetic. Yes, you do. If you. If you have um, if you have some object of type uh, blah, and you try to call a cdef method from outside, it'll say that there is no such method. I mean, you can't even call a cdef method no, self, if you don't cast the thing. Self is separate. Self, self is automatically no, but, type. 
I'm not talking about once you get into the function doing casting. I'm talking about being able to call the function in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, you need to cast it. To get yeah, that's what I'm saying. But if you don't cast it, then you might end up getting the Python version, which will be slower, right? So that's all. Does everyone then like this syntax? I mean, before we start using it, maybe we should decide. Should we make it explicit, or should we make it implicit? Or I this is going to be a massive patch to change all these CDEF overridables to desk. But it might be a good idea to just try it with CDEF overridables. It's a find and replace in box. It's very easy. True. To make that patch. Yes, there's going to be a big patch. Who cares? <laughs> I prefer the overridable because it's explicit and it seems like there's a lot of natural situations in which you want the current behavior to stay the current behavior. I mean, there's a whole can of worms if we change the current behavior to be a lot different than it is right now. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Well, but what you want to do if you want to be able to override. You want to be able to override. I mean, so not making but things overridable may do. But it's not so simple because things, if you make it so anything could be overridden in pure Python, there's some disadvantages to doing that. I mean, I if we're making arithmetic overridable, I'm not quite sure what, what you could make a case for not overriding. But you, you want to make it as no, easy as possible to yeah. go from Python to Cypher, right? Yeah. And preferably to end up with remotely efficient Cypher. So yeah. can't you just really think hard about what happens if you have Python code with devs? What happens to that if you replace those devs in a Cypher version by CDEF overridables? So do you yeah. get big explosions? Then you should not uh, make uh, the the the, the CDEF overridable should be explicit. If in nearly all situations, actually, you could just replace it with the CDEF overridable, it might be a very good idea to just not be explicit about CDEF, CDEF overridable. Yeah. The only disadvantage of this being CDEF overridable by default yeah. is an extra method, and. I mean, technically, the only disadvantage. If and there's also this, the code writing issue yeah, that I pointed out. If this is automatically this, then you get an extra method call. What's the, it's not an extra method call. It's a... It's a, it's a Tuple just, packing and packing also? But it's a C call. It's a C call, yes. So it's, it is it's a C call. A, it's, Oh, it's irrelevant. Well, because, oh, I don't know. I mean, when you say method integers, call, uh, you mash in Python. Yeah. Taking, you can eliminate a C call and say 15%. But for most stuff, yeah, it's <laughs> if if you're adding integers, I, I eliminated a C column. You could you know, could increase in speed. You could compile to us. Well, but um, to assembly, I have a method like function with two entry points. <laughs> that would <laughs> yeah. and mm -hmm. just put one <laughs> next to the other. Okay, so. For now, we'll leave it at CDEF overridable. And um, maybe there's a case to be made for making all dev functions CDEF overridable, but now you can do that by default. First thing. But at least we can rewrite the end arithmetic to use this. Uh, so, what is it going to be called? Underscore add underscore? Um, yes, that sounds good. Do that or add info. Underscore, yeah, because that's what it is in all the Python. Yeah, you should already shunt. Okay. So, and that's, um, I started working on generators. I couldn't resist after uh, generators. Jeez, that's a challenge. <laughs> um, so, in Python, you mean what like it does yield. is it steals the stack frame, yeah. which is a Python interpreter object. And then it's real easy because now it has a stack frame. When you call next, it just starts running at that stack frame until it hits a yield and steals the stack frame again and returns an object. You can't do that from C. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> there's a stack pointer, right? There, there's a stack pointer. You can, I guess, you know, catch the local variables. And <laughs> so, um, so that's why it's a work in progress. But I have a, it makes a new, um, a new class um, that has a next function. 
and inserts the body of the yield into there. Um, so, but I've had tons of time to work on this. Mm -hmm. But it's been interesting. But that you can occur in all kinds of. So you want to say. Yeah. So what? So what you do is you um, store the context in the class. Yeah. Can you use trunk place? Uh huh. Yeah. So one of the things I remember noticing that we wanted fixed in Cython was the underscore underscore new method. Which means yeah. It's like messed up. You want to call it? Well. The name feels wrong, because it's different from what it is in Python, but apart yeah. from that, I just remember there seems to be a lot of overhead involved with, especially when there's all these parameters that come in, and it has to do all this crap with unpacking, oh, I can't remember what it was. I just remember the feeling that the overhead on that function was just way too high. Um, yeah, so... Does it have Python calling semantics? It does. See, that's that's stupid. It's ridiculous. So, I think it should be named to, renamed to Alloc. I agree. And Greg Ewing agrees to it. I saw that on some posting. Yeah. Well, he seemed reluctant to actually do it. But. Yeah, because it'll break a lot of stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, but I think the thing is, I think he chose the name new before new style classes came out or something. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think that new had any meaning when he chose that. Because that's a big performance issue. Because yeah. that is on every tiny object. Now, the thing is, the semantics, um, it, it it has those when it's doing an init. It already has the objects, so it doesn't have to recreate the objects. It just the new function takes the objects that it's going to pass to init and pass them into the new function as well. And if you write this, Like that, it doesn't do any impact. Because this is a pointer, and so it just passes that pointer on to the variable args. This is a pointer, it just passes that on to keywords. Um, actually, I'd have to look at this. Can you this is that? often null, and I think it might create a dictionary if you explicitly say that. Because what, what I really would like at the moment, although I know this is a band aid, uh -huh. is just to have like underscore underscore fast alloc or fast new or something, uh -huh. cdef method, which if it's there, it just gets called, and if it's not, yeah. it doesn't, and that's it. And then, I mean, so many of our examples, like the integer object and whatever, all these things could just have one of them instead of this, this new, and then that doesn't interact with other stuff that's going on in Pyrex development. So it's a bit sketchy, but I mean, it just yeah. seems, to, it seems like a simple solution to that problem. So I think, um, well, I think the solution is, well, one of the things is sometimes you want arguments, for instance, matrix construction. Yeah. You've got to have the arguments of the size yeah. um, to do your allocation. But I think it would be reasonable is if your new method had that signature, <laughs> then it would just call that directly. So if it has that signature. If it has this signature, then it wouldn't bother yeah. using Python plot conventions. Yeah. When you say in the matrix one, you call, so those parameters are like ints, right? Uh, no, they're, they're Python objects. Oh, okay. Because it's being called, like, the thing yeah. is, yeah. It's not C there. Yeah. Right. And I don't know how to make that faster, but the integer, I mean, for matrices, the overhead of. It's funny, because that, if you did that, what you're suggesting there, it sort of means that the signature has to be either tri the trivial signature or it has to be the same as the init signature. Is that true? Right now, it has to be the same as the init signature. Does Cypher die if it's not? No, but. Um, it will die in Pyrex because it'll try to pass the arguments in and it'll explain it doesn't have the right arguments. Oh, when it gets called? Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Yeah. It'll, oh, it runs it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> easy. But cool. um, I think this, if you just did this, it should be able to, um, rather than dying, it should just say, I think it ignore all these arguments when I call the method. Yeah. Yeah. So that's good. So. Let's see. Right. Your, the fact that your the title says history of this slide, and oh, that has nothing I'm worried that you're like at one third through your first talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, that's the end. Okay. Sure. <laughs>
let the coercion controversy begin. <laughs> Should we get drunk first?